I'm going to talk about uh, barriers to HIV cure. Um, these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, what I'd like to concentrate on is what has emerged uh, relatively recently as uh, probably or possibly the major barrier uh, to cure. Now, um, <clears throat> the conventional view is that uh, the main barrier to cure is um, a small population of blatantly infected resting CD4 cells, um, <clears throat> which appear to arise when activated cells are infected uh, before or during the transition back to a resting uh, memory state. And <clears throat> um, in that state, uh, the uh, factors needed for HIV transcription are, are not present or are not in the correct form, as has been elo eloquently described uh, by John. Uh, and so you end up with um, a stable, uh, a transcriptionally silent form of the provirus in a long-lived uh, memory T cell, and if that cell becomes activated again in the future, it can begin uh, to produce uh, virus. Now, <clears throat> um, the stability of this uh, latent reservoir in resting CD4 cells uh, was originally thought to simply reflect the long half-life of memory T cells. Uh, but what has become uh, clear uh, more recently is that it actually uh, more likely reflects the proliferation of these cells driven by antigen, cytokines, or effects related to the site of integration. So the half-life um, was originally demonstrated with the viral outgrowth assay. It turned out to be something like 3.7 years, a guaranteeing lifetime uh, persistence. These original uh, studies were done quite a long time ago, uh, and recently David Margolis has repeated this work in patients on newer regimens um, and uh, come up with essentially exactly the same half-life, saying that all of the improvements in antiretroviral therapy over the years haven't actually impacted this fundamental problem of a non-replicating form of the virus persisting in these uh, quiescent cells. Now another indication of persistence is residual viremia. This is the low-level of free virus in the plasma of treated patients, typically about one copy uh, per mil. Uh, and um, uh, in a series of studies which uh, we did uh, a long time ago, which as far as I can tell have never been read by anyone, um, we characterized the sequence of this residual viremia and it turned out uh, to be a drug sensitive virus that continued to be released for years without uh, evolution uh, and it was archival in character. All of this consistent with the idea that it simply represents a few of these latently infected cells getting activated every day, producing virus which cannot infect additional cells because of the drugs, but which you could pick up in the plasma with a sensitive enough uh, assay. Um, and this hypothesis, to test this hypothesis, we carried out intensification studies, uh, adding a fourth drug to see whether residual viremia went down any further with addition of another drug from another class and uh, it turned out that it did not, and this was uh, produce, reproduced in many subsequent uh, studies. Intensification has absolutely no effect on residual viremia because it's coming from cells that were infected prior to the initiation of treatment. Now, the examination of residual viremia uh, led to one very unexpected observation, which we did not understand at the time and which uh, uh, miraculously has become relevant again. Um, so these are uh, sequences from a patient on long-term ART, sequences from resting and activated CD4 cells. Um, and uh, in this patient, we also had a lot of sequences from the residual viremia, the trace level of free virus in the plasma. And those are in the colored triangles. Uh, sometimes uh, they match, uh, consistent with the idea that the residual viremia just comes from the activation of latently infected cells. Um, however, uh, the surprise was that um, in this patient and in about half the patients we studied, uh, the residual viremia was dominated by a single uh, clonal sequence that was obtained repeatedly in multiple independent limiting dilution amplifications over the course of a couple of uh, years. And we thought that this must represent the massive clonal expansion of uh, infected uh, cells. Uh, uh, but the problem was that we couldn't find a cellular sequence that matched this plasma sequence. So this is something that we did not understand at the time. Uh, here's some more examples of these predominant plasma clones. Now, because of the low level of, of free virus in the plasma treated patients, this analysis was done with a subgenomic PCR looking at just a portion of the Paul gene. Uh, we subsequently developed ways to obtain the full sequence of individual HIV proviruses, um, and uh, this allowed us really to um, get the first look at the landscape of proviruses that persist in treated patients. And here, the surprise was that 
almost all of the proviruses were defective. In this uh, slide, the white areas are mapped to deletions, the green are hypermutated proviruses, and, and intact proviruses are very rare. Um, and so uh, this explained why we couldn't find the cellular sequences that were giving rise to uh, the residual viremia. Most of those would have been um, intact. Uh, we simply didn't have the sampling uh, depth to find those uh, sequences. And the caveat here is that any subgenomic analysis of HIV proviruses is mainly capturing defective proviruses. And this caveat applies to also the uh, GAG PCR assays or other types of DNA PCR assays that are, that are commonly used to measure the reservoir. They are almost all, uh, they're capturing mostly defective proviruses, um, as you can sort of get a, get a sense of from this uh, slide. If you're just amplifying the GAG, the small portion of the GAG uh, gene, you really don't uh, uh, know whether you're dealing with an intact provirus or not. Uh, so we recently developed um, an intact proviral DNA assay that uses a digital droplet PCR to interrogate um, individual proviruses at multiple informative regions to distinguish intact and defective proviruses. And we think this will be uh, very useful in um, uh, quantitating uh, the reservoir in uh, treatment uh, in various uh, cure uh, strategies. Um, anyway, in the course of analysis, analyzing these proviral sequences, we came uh, upon uh, observations like this. Um, multiple cells with exactly the same bizarre a uh, defect. Uh, and these proviruses are so defective that there's no way uh, these viruses could replicate. So the only way to understand this is uh, uh, that a cell becomes infected, the defects arise during reverse transcription, and then that cell proliferates, copying um, this defective viral genome into uh, the progeny uh, cells. So this provided direct evidence for uh, proliferation of infected cells. Um, definitive evidence came from uh, studies of uh, HIV integration sites uh, by uh, Frank Maldarellia uh, and by Thor Wagner. Um, and um, they detected identical integration sites in multiple cells um, and uh, went on to propose, in fact, that uh, this was the result of proliferation and that the proliferation was actually driven by essentially an assertional mutagenesis, the uh, integration of uh, the provirus into genes associated with uh, cell division. Um, now, the problem with these studies is that the integration site analysis only captures um, the ends of the viral genome, so you don't know whether the provirus is intact or not. And most likely, based on our work, most of the sequences detected in these studies were defective. Um, so, um, and you can imagine that uh, cells carrying proviruses with defects like this would be able to proliferate because um, most of the viral genes are, in fact, defective. Uh, so the real question is whether cells with intact proviruses can proliferate. Uh, and so to address this, we carried out a variation of the viral outgrowth assay that allowed us to capture a large number of independent clones of replication-competent virus from individual patients, and then we carried out full genome sequencing and, and compared them. And the surprise was that um, in almost every patient, we could find sister cells that were, had identical proviruses, even from a single uh, blood sample. And in, in, in this study, 57 percent of the independent isolates had a matching sequence from the same blood sample. And uh, John Mellers and um, Michelle Newsom's white group uh, came up with exactly the same uh, findings. So uh, this says that, in fact, um, at any, any given time, most of the cells in the reservoir are actually comprised of these uh, clonally expanded uh, cells carrying uh, identical uh, proviruses. So the proliferation of infected cells is to some extent unexpected. Um, it could be driven by antigen, by cytokines, or by uh, effects related to the site of integration, as I mentioned. Um, but um, antigen and cytokines um, that drive proliferation also turn on virus gene expression. In fact, IL-7 was one of the first latency reversing um, agents. And um, uh, cells that are productively infected die very quickly. We know this from the classic work on uh, viral dynamics. So um, this proliferation is, is a bit hard to, to understand. Um, but um, from what I've shown you, um, we now know that uh, the reservoir is actually composed of uh, uh, some very large uh, clonal populations that have expanded to such a great extent that you can capture sister cells that are part of the same clone in a single um, blood sample. And this is really an enormous degree uh, of clonal expansion. In fact, um, there are probably smaller clones, many smaller clones, that we uh, can't really define uh, with the, the depth of sample. 
um, that we have. So this proliferation is a major factor in reservoir stability and we need to understand it. Um, and the first question we asked was whether this proliferation um, uh, is sort of continuous and ongoing as, uh, as might be expected if it was some kind of cell autonomous stimulus related to the site of integration. And so we've carried out longitudinal analysis of um, these clones, clones of cells carrying replication combinant proviruses uh, in patients on long-term ART. Uh, over the course of a couple of years, there are some clones that persist, uh, then comp com <coughs> comprise a significant fraction of the reservoir over time, uh, but other clones um, appear and disappear uh, over uh, the span of uh, months uh, to years. Uh, and you can see the same thing in the analysis of the residual viremia. So um, in this patient, for example, at uh, this time point, there's a dominant uh, a plasma clone. A year later, it's been replaced by a clone that's actually ancestral phylogenetically, uh, but becomes dominant, and then a year later, a third clone. So what's actually happening is that um, these clones are waxing and waning, um, and this is really what the reservoir looks like. Um, it's actually a very <coughs> dynamic collection of uh, cells that are undergoing this uh, process of uh, expansion and contraction uh, with the total size of the reservoir remaining roughly constant. So this raises a number of interesting questions. Um, is each cell in the reservoir uh, capable of this degree of enormous clonal expansion? That would be a, a very disturbing, uh, disturbing finding. What are the stimuli that drive uh, the expansion? And do those stimuli induce virus gene expression, which, which would give us a window on actually attacking these cells during this proliferative uh, process? So uh, to get at the last question, um, we've asked whether there is any selection for CTL escape mutants over time in patients on ART. Um, so um, we've previously shown that most of the cells in the reservoir um, have escape mutations or have proviruses with escape mutations in dominant dominant CTL epitopes like the SL9 epitope and GAG uh, shown here. But uh, for subdominant epitopes, you can see um, uh, a mixture of uh, proviruses with escape mutations and, and with wild type sequence. And then you can ask, well, what happens over time uh, to the proportion of wild type and escape uh, mutations? Um, and here in this patient, uh, uh, sampled now um, uh, nine years later, you can see that the proportion has not changed at all. Uh, so whatever this proliferative process is, uh, there does not seem to be any selection, uh, any uh, evidence of immune selection by uh, cytolytic T cells. Here's the same result for epitopes in Paul and uh, in Neff. And um, we can uh, summarize all this data here, um, looking in five patients sampled approximately 10 years apart, um, early and, and, and late time points. And, uh, there really isn't any change in the proportion of wild type versus uh, mutant epitopes. So no, no evidence for CTL uh, pressure exerted on this population. Um, another way to look at this is, is to ask whether um, clonally expanded proviruses um, have more CTL escape mutations. And so if you look at clones versus the, the single sequences that we isolate, um, there really is no evidence for a selection um, uh, for a CTL escape. Now, you could argue that, um, that the problem, and in fact, we've previously shown that the CTL response in most patients on long-term uh, ART um, is very poor at uh, killing autologous infected cells in which latency has been reversed. Um, so we've also looked in elite controllers who would have stronger CTL responses and uh, looked early, at early and late time points at the proportion of wild type and escape uh, uh, mutations, um, and uh, if anything, uh, the proportion with wild type is increasing. So really, no evidence for CTL selection. So uh, even without CTL selection, um, the induction of viral gene expression should expose the cell to viral cytopathic effects, and if anything, should uh, limit the degree of proliferation uh, that occurs. So we can, um, we can ask whether um, cells with defective proviruses versus cells with intact proviruses um, or exhibit um, any kind of uh, differential selection. And we can uh, certainly show this in vitro. Um, and these are experiments in which we plate uh, resting CD4 cells from patients at essentially one cell per well, and then stimulate the cells uh, four times uh, with CD3, CD28 to induce proliferation. And then using the uh, intact proviral DNA assay that, that I mentioned, we can 
determine whether each well had an intact provirus originally or a defective one, and the degree to which the cell harboring of that provirus has proliferated. And what we see um, is, is actually quite striking. Uh, the y-axis is really an indication of the level of proliferation. Um, cells with intact proviruses don't proliferate uh, very well, whereas cells with defective proviruses, either uh, uh, five prime or three prime defects, some of them can proliferate uh, quite um, extensively under these uh, conditions. So at least under these conditions, there's a dramatic uh, selection uh, against proliferation of, of cells of intact proviruses. It has nothing to do with integration sites. We've looked at this uh, with Rick Bushman's uh, group. Rather, it has to do with the nature of the provirus. The cells that have proliferated extensively have very highly defective proviruses with defects in almost um, every uh, viral gene. Um, but uh, we know that in vivo, uh, as I mentioned, we can see very large clones, expanded clones, harboring replication-competent virus. So what does, it, what, does this, what does this mean? It really suggests that the proliferation occurs um, without induction of viral gene expression. Now, so to look at this uh, in vivo, we've asked, is there any selection for uh, cells with defective proviruses over time? Uh, so this is the landscape of proviruses uh, in a typical uh, treated patient. The intact proviruses, which are in red, are very rare. Um, now we can look uh, uh, nine or ten years later, uh, and what you see is actually the, the, the fraction of cells with intact proviruses has actually increased. And um, in the center of the circles, I'm showing uh, the proportion that are represented by clonal sequences, and you can see the increase in intact proviruses is actually due to a single uh, a clone that has expanded over this uh, time period. So again, no evidence for selection against cells with intact proviruses. Uh, here's the same uh, result in another patient where intact proviruses have actually increased over time, and again, it appears to reflect expansion of, of, of single uh, clones. Um, and then uh, looked at another way, we can ask whether cells with intact proviruses are just as likely to proliferate in vivo uh, comparing intact and defective proviruses and whether or not they're present in clones or not. Again, um, we don't see any real selection against uh, proliferation of cells with intact proviruses. So what does this all mean? Um, sort of underlying the apparent stability of this reservoir, there's actually a very complex set of dynamics going on. Um, and uh, <laughs> it appears now that most cells comprising this reservoir are actually generated by proliferation not uh, by direct infection. Um, infected, these uh, infected cell clones wax and wane over the course of months to years. Um, cells with intact and defective proviruses uh, can both uh, proliferate in, vi in, in vivo, uh, but in vitro, uh, under some conditions, cells with intact proviruses do not proliferate as well, particularly with strong uh, stimulation through uh, the T cell uh, receptor. But longitudinal studies in vivo do not support a preferential in vivo replication of cells with defective proviruses or cells with CTL escape mutations. And this suggests that the in vivo proliferation occurs through a mechanism that does not drive a high level of viral gene expression, making it uh, harder for us to, to, to get at this. Now, I just want to point out that we do have uh, in vitro evidence that cells with intact provirus can proliferate without uh, releasing infectious virus. And this comes from uh, a modified form of the viral outgrowth assay in which we look in, in wells that are negative for viral outgrowth after stimulation with, with a mitogen. Um, and uh, we take those cells and re-stimulate them. Um, and even though all of the cells in the culture have undergone proliferation, some of the, the cells don't produce infectious virus until after a second or a third or even a fourth round of a T cell activation, indicating that cells uh, can become activated and proliferate without uh, releasing enough, at least enough infectious virus to uh, lead to uh, viral uh, outgrowth. So this is a problem. I want to close with um, a word about uh, the SIV model. I think we, you know, we clearly need to um, understand this proliferative process uh, because I think it's key to persistence. Um, but there's a problem in using the SIV model. We wondered whether uh, clonal expansion occurs for SIV. Uh, uh, most uh, SIV experiments involve uh, treating animals a very short period after infection. If you do that and you do sequencing, you'll see 
a high fraction of clonal sequences, but that's simply because there hasn't been time for divergence from the infecting stock. If you uh, let the animals go for several months uh, to a year before treatment, uh, then there is um, a significant diversity emerges, uh, but the fraction of clonal sequence is very low. And that's because the timing of most SIV experiments does not allow this clonal expansion process to occur. So um, uh, the, uh, the, this, the data shown here are from animals that were um, infected for almost two years and then put on treatment for a year, uh, for six months to a year. And there's a small fraction that have clonal sequences, but it's much less than you would see in patients on ART that are shown here in, in the black circles. So the problem is that uh, the time scale of most SIV experiments does not allow this proliferative process to, to uh, reach the extent that we see in HIV infection. And I think this is going to be a problem that we're going to have to deal with in trying to to deal with the problem of clonal expansion. So let me stop there. I want to thank um, people involved in this work. I've been working on this problem with my wife, Janet, for many years. Yachi Ho did all the original work on defective proviruses along with Katie Brunner. Um, Jessica Wang uh, and uh, Jennifer Kwan did a lot of the work on proliferation. Uh, Greg Laird uh, developed the uh, intact proviral DNA assay, which I didn't have time uh, to go into. Um, and Annie Antar is, is responsible for most of the longitudinal data that I showed. I um, want to thank a number of collaborators, especially Steve, who really made um, a, a lot of this work possible through collaboration and through his uh, patient uh, cohorts. Uh, so I'll stop there and be happy to try and answer any questions.